In the somnolent July afternoon, the unbroken line of brownstone houses down the long Brooklyn street resembled an army massed at attention. They were all one uniform red brownstone, all with high massive stone stoops and black iron grill fences staving off the sun, all draped in ivory as though mourning. Their somber facades, indifferent to the summer's heat and passion, faced a park while their backs reared dark against the sky. They were only three or four stories tall, squat, yet they gave the impression of formidable height. Welcome to the inaugural episode of Positive Readings. That was the opening to Brown Girl Brownstones, Paula Marshall's first novel, published in 1959. Here, on the back of my book, the novel's credited as being the first to portray the inner life of a young female African-American, as well as depicting the cross-cultural conflict between West Indians and American blacks. Though, I would argue that latter claim is only alluded to. For me, the novel's really more about a father and daughter relationship and what happens when a father isn't the true father he needs to be or the father that a daughter needs him to be. Although the novel is divided into four books or parts, the narrative itself can be divided into two. The first half of the book focuses mainly on Selena's adolescence and the destruction of her parents' marriage. The latter half deals with Selena's sexual awakening, and I would argue is of lesser interest than the first. The first half of the novel, when Selena is a young girl, focuses primarily on her relationship with her father, Dighton Boyce. The family is from Barbados, and lives in Brooklyn, in one of the many brownstones that gives the book its title. At the beginning of the novel, we're told that many white families in the neighborhood have moved off to more prosperous neighborhoods, and the Bajan community, or the Barbadians, are there trying to uh, earn a living and eventually own a house. The core conflict in the first strand of the novel is between Selena's father, Dighton, and his wife, Scylla. Scylla works hard and she wants to eventually own the brownstone that they live in. Dighton, on the other hand, is always between jobs and always working on trying to get into that next job. He dreams big and he refuses to go the slow step into success. First, he's taking courses to become an accountant. And finally, when he passes, he decides that he doesn't want to join the company because he doesn't want to start down low. He wants to start up high. Then he turns to trying to learn the trumpet, but that also doesn't really materialize into anything. He dreams big and always dreams aloud to Selena. The climax of this first story strand comes when Dighton finds out that he owns property in Barbados. He dreams of moving back and owning a house with servants. Scylla, on the other hand, wants him to sell the property so they can own the brownstone in New York. Dighton, of course, doesn't want to do this, and eventually Scylla finds a way to get the property from him and sell it, which she does behind his back. When Dighton finds out about this, he talks her into allowing him to go get the money, which she doesn't have much options because it is in his name. Scylla's treachery is paid in return with Dighton's, he goes to the bank, takes the money out, and spends it all in one day, buying his wife and his girls dresses and himself a fancy trumpet that his wife, Scylla, eventually smashes. After that, Dighton goes downhill. Eventually, he has an accident where he loses the use of one hand, moves out of the house, and joins a religious cult. Finally, his wife decides to turn him in for being an illegal alien, and he's forced to return to Barbados. On the way, he either jumps or falls into the ocean and dies. Dighton's death ends the first narrative and casts a shadow into the second, into Selena's young adulthood. In the second story strand, the novel primarily deals with Selena's relationship with an older man named Clive. Clive is a lot like Dighton in that he doesn't want to be part of the Bajan community. He's not focused on trying to get ahead, going to a great university, buying property. He was in the war, he's an aspiring artist, but really he doesn't really want to do anything. He's disillusioned, just as Dighton was, and he spends most of the time in the basement. Throughout that strand of the novel, we see Selena constantly going to him 
And in, in many ways, we see that Clive is, is a stand-in for her father. And that love that she's having with him, even though it is sexual, seems to be a stand-in for the love that she couldn't have with her father. While the second story strand is certainly well written and has us as readers constantly wishing that Selena doesn't come to, to Clive and his charm and isn't uh, sucked into that what appears to be a meaningless relationship in a dead-end life. Despite some of the effectiveness in the writing of the second story strand, in other places it feels over, overwrought, especially with the allusions to James Baldwin and Thomas Wolfe and the overt dealing of racism. Uh, the subtle racism that's presented in the first strand is far more interesting. With Dighton, we see the real effects of being unable to get ahead in America and having to f follow these sequence of steps to slowly work your way up. In this respect, the first story strand isn't only the story of a father and a daughter, but also the story of how the inability to succeed or the inability to play by certain rules can really affect an entire family. In this regard, the, the real tragedy of the novel comes in the first strand. While the second strand certainly does uh, lead us to believe that Selena's life might become tragic, it, certainly, it ends on a hopeful note. And considering the character of Dighton Boys, I couldn't help but recall a conversation I heard recently between Glenn Laurie and John McWhorton. In that discussion, John McWhorton was talking about a concept uh, within the black community or a characteristic that he called uh, being a badass motherfucker, something that he thought was a problem. And Glenn Laurie went on to uh, give detailed examples of how that affected, that concept affected his own life, um, that, which was quite moving. Uh, and I was thinking about Dighton Boyce, that perhaps this is the same thing that they were talking about. Um, and to some degree, I think that is it. Uh, however, uh, I think there's something more there um, that also is tied into education and um, adapting into a society. After all, this is a Bildungsroman. Uh, this re reminded me of an excerpt, which I'm going to read part of here, from uh, Nietzsche's Human All Too Human, comes from number 242, uh, which he summarizes the central problem of becoming an adult or also education. So I'll quote it here. He says, in short, how can the individual be integrated into the counterpoint of private and public culture? How can he both sing the melody and simultaneously make it the accompaniment? End quote. So how, how can the individual sing the melody and also make it the accompaniment? And I think that is the central problem. How can we find our, you know, sing along with, with, the, with the group, but also find a way to make that the accompaniment of what we're doing ourselves. And for Dighton Boyce, that is his central problem. Uh, and that is, and eventually, that is what kind of ended up crushing him. And his daughter has that same problem, his daughter Selena, who's the main character of the book here. In this way, I find this novel uh, deeply interesting, especially as one that shows the, the difficulties of trying to uh, of being an outsider in a community, an outsider in society, and uh, being forced into a certain type of progression uh, to get ahead, and uh, not wanting to play by the rules. Um, so for me, that was more affecting than any of the comments that the book might have made about uh, overtly about racism, because that is also about racism. Another interesting aspect of this novel, being that it's written in 1959, but deals with the uh, pre-World War II era, is that there is a not so subtle comment on the mechanization or the industrialization of America at that time, and how machines are entering the kind of public consciousness or entering into to, uh, individuals' life. So we get two scenes with machines. One is when Selena in the first narrative is quite worried about uh, what her mother plans to do to take away her father's property. And she, go and she eventually goes and visits her mother while she works at a factory. And we have the constant sounds and machines there. 
The other one, which is more interesting, I think, as far as the, uh, the quote here that, I'm gonna, that I have prepared, is when her father, Dighton, uh, has the accident, the injury that destroys his hand. So in that quote, I'm just going to read part of that here. Um, here it is, quote, The sound became the machines roaring at the factory, and she, Selena, saw him, Dighton, a slim figure with an ascetic face standing amid the giant complex of pistons and power. Couldn't it have spared him? And thinking of that impersonal brutality, she wept. So impersonal brutality is the line that stands out for me, or the phrase. And uh, in many ways, that's not just machines, uh, but I think that could also be the entire mechanism of uh, America, the American dream at that time. Uh, Scylla is certainly caught up in that machine, and she becomes impersonally brutal in many different, many instances. One, as she, uh, you know, turns her husband in to have him uh, sent back to uh, Barbados, but also uh, when she eventually does become a homeowner, she uh, rents out rooms to other people in the Bajan community at very high prices, not caring about uh, them trying to also get ahead. And, of course, uh, Dighton himself uh, being the uh, chief victim of that impersonal brutality in the first uh, novel strand. And the second novel strand, we could also view Selena's struggle as being one with the impersonal, brutal machine. Uh, in that case, m- more so racism, overtly. Uh, with, uh, and that kind of culminates when uh, she visits a friend's house of this dancing troupe she's in, and the mother says a racist comment that upsets her. Uh, Again, though, uh, the more affecting for me comes in the first book. Also of interest is a look at religious fanaticism. As I stated before, Dighton eventually retreats into uh, a cult. He ends up working at a restaurant owned by uh, Father Divine. And... uh, at one point, Selena visits a, a dinner with him in the Bronx, and at that point, we see that she's become the adult, essentially. Uh, at that point, we see that her father doesn't see through Father Divine. She doesn't see the fraud that he is, and uh, she's left kind of heartbroken, seeing that her father has uh, not only left the family, lost the use of his arm, but now essentially has uh, lost the ability to recognize uh, the fraudulent. So as you can see, this novel is really one of uh, disillusionment with uh, America and the American dream, though again, at the same time, it does end with a somewhat hopeful note uh, that you know life continues on and uh, there is something she can make of herself. Unfortunately, this book isn't as popular as it should be, and presently, as far as I know, is only available in this uh, Dover issue here. I don't mean to belittle the, the Dover publications. They, they do great at what they do, which is they make rare books or books that are less popular or maybe going out of print. They make them available cheaply, and they do that here. But, uh, you know, it's not a, a, a nicely made book. There's no... Um, researched introduction or footnotes, and I think this book is deserving of that. So hopefully one day we'll see a a nice Penguin or Oxford edition coming out. Uh, I would highly recommend people to check this book out. I don't imagine this will be in the canon anytime soon, but uh, it deserves to be, and uh, it would be a great book to read in high school for the high school student, uh, and a great book to read to understand more about America in the 1950s and 60s. Thank you for watching the inaugural episode of Positive Readings. If you like it, please subscribe. If you didn't, let me know where it went wrong for you in the comments. Reading and culture are choices. Let's choose them.